Good evening, friends and brethren. It's a genuine delight to have this opportunity to worship with you and to say a few things from God's Word. It really is an honor, especially with all the beautiful things that have already been said in the service this evening. Very grateful for you, thankful for your dedication and your devotion to the Lord that brings you out even this night. We had, even during the meeting, I want to commend you for that. We had good attendance, and I know there were a lot of sacrifices made, especially with young families, but so many were here when they were able, and I just commend you for that. Uh, it's good to have our brother Johnny and sister Chessa with us tonight. Very thankful for that, and I'm also very grateful to have my beautiful wife here tonight. She's able to be out after just over two and a half weeks ago, or about two and a half weeks ago, getting her leg chopped off and a new knee put on. It's amazing what can happen nowadays. I wonder if they can do anything for me about here, right in this midsection. I don't know. That'd be a miracle. But it's good to have her. She is just so delighted to be back here with you and all of us and especially getting to worship God. It is, it's just a real blessing. And I, I, I just thank you so much for all that you're doing for us. The compassion and the generosity has been so humbling, and I mean that. We truly love you, and I thank you for all that you, you've been doing for us. But this is, a, this is a church where love does abound. Love for God and His Word and love for one another, love for others. It's abounding. In fact, one of my recent prayers, I don't mind telling you, was that God would help me do my part to nurture that spirit here that it might continue for years to come. And I think that even what we heard this morning, Eric was doing his part to contribute to that. And I commend our brother for the good lesson. But there is so much love here, and I hope that we are mindful of that and, and continuing to work toward that. In glorifying our God. In speaking of glorifying our God and in knowing Him better and walking with Him and having a better understanding of Him, I turn to 2 Peter chapter 1 to continue this series once a month of looking at these attributes and these qualities that Peter's saying if you follow this pattern, if you apply yourself to this attitude, to this behavior, to this manner of life, if you apply these virtues that I'm telling you, he says you'll get to heaven. You'll understand God along the way. You'll take on his divine nature of, of, of understanding holiness, and then you'll be with him in eternity. But here's how you do it. It's not going to be some blank effort. It's not going to be some something that you're just not conscious of or something that's not intentional, but rather it's, it's the exact opposite. And he says that in 2 Peter chapter 1, like in verse 10, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Very important, very important instructions he's given us here. Certainly worthy of our time and consideration. But he said what he just did in these verses in a context. And in the context, he was telling us that here's how you know God. He's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. And so we have to commit ourselves to these things. And he says in verse 5, but also for this very reason, given all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, self-control, and patience, and godliness, and brotherly kindness, and love. And he talks about if these things are yours and abound, you will neither or be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You'll understand him, I think is what he's saying. And I, I chose the image of a bridge, building a bridge, because it... In my mind, that seems to make sense with what he's saying here. You know, you build a bridge over a chasm or some ravine or some valley or some wide river. You do that so that you can get across and then get across freely. You couldn't do it without it as freely. And in my mind, that's what he's saying here. 
He's saying, I'm giving you the blueprint. I'm giving you something that if you will construct in your life, in your heart, it will get you from here to there. It'll get you from here to God and to understand God. And then in the end, dwell with him eternally. This is how you do it. It's the, it's the blueprint. It's the bridge that you need to get there. And as we see what he's talking about, we have already noted about the importance of giving all diligence. Going to heaven is purposeful. And it's zeal. It's, it's effort. Daily, really. Daily commitment to go to heaven. Giving all diligence. But he says, giving all diligence add to your faith. And there's a reason why he listed that one first because it's all about faith. Everything's about faith. Your confidence in God, your trust in Him, your devotion, it's all centered on your faith. And really, we know that without faith you can't please God. You have to believe He is and you have to believe that He rewards those who diligently seek Him. But it all starts and ends with faith. It's everything. And so he says that with this faith, you're to add to it. Add to your faith. And in looking at this concept, I thought of a few points I want to share with you that I think can help us add to our faith. There's more I know that can be said, but I want to limit it to these few thoughts. The first thought I hope we see in this lesson is that faith is possible. And what I mean by that is it is possible for you to have faith in God. It is possible for you to have that faith that pleases Him. You can do that, right? You and I can be exactly like all the heroes and examples of faith in the Bible who please God. You can do that. We're no different. We have the ability to trust God in any circumstance. I, there's a lot of examples in the Bible on this. I want to center around one. And it's a person in the Old Testament. And he was a king of Judah, King Asa. And in fact, King Asa was the great-grandson of Solomon. We understand that Solomon, when he departed, his son Rehoboam took the throne, and Rehoboam messed it all up. There was a division in the kingdom between Israel and Judah. And then Rehoboam reigned for a period of time. Then his son Abijah reigned for about three years. And then you had Abijah's son Asa come on the scene, roughly 20 years after Solomon. And with Asa, we see a tremendous example of not only of having faith, but the importance of keeping your faith, adding to faith. He's a tremendous story on that. In 1 Kings chapter 15, notice with me how he had the faith to do some tremendous things in his day and time. Like our brother said, you know, things are changing. They are constantly around us. And there is decay. And it was the same thing in the kingdom of Judah when Asa came on the scene. There was, there was decay. And he took a stand against that. In 1 Kings chapter 15, notice with me in verse 9, where it says through verse 15 that in the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Asa became king over Judah. And he reigned 41 years in Jerusalem. His grandmother Grandmother's name was Maacah, the granddaughter of Abishalom. Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did his father David. He banished the perverted persons from the land, removed all the idols that his father had made. Also, he removed Maacah, his grandmother, from being queen mother because she had made an obscene image of Asherah. And Asa cut down her obscene image and burned it in the brook Kidron. But the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was loyal to the Lord all his days. He also brought into the house of the Lord the things which his father had dedicated, and the things which he himself had dedicated, silver and gold and utensils. So you have, you have renovation here. You have a person who's doing some major changes in their kingdom, in society. And he, the text says he did some extraordinary things. He did what was right. Unlike those he, that preceded him, he did what was right. And one of the first things he did was he banished the perverted persons. 
Now in my footnote, it says that in the Hebrew term for this perverted behavior, it's those practicing sodomy and prostitution in religious rituals. That's things of a homosexual nature that were, that were taking place in this kingdom in a religious manner. He got rid of that. He took a stand against that sexual immorality. He removed the idols and all the things associated with that behavior. And then he took a stand against some family. He cleansed the temple. And there was ten years of peace. But like I said, he took a stand against some family, which was tremendous to do. Asa inherited a kingdom from a father who was wicked. And not only was his father wicked, his grandfather was not the man he should have been. Solomon's son, Rehoboam, was not the man he should have been. He was following down the path of Solomon's unfaithfulness to God in this idolatry. And the text notes especially how he took a stand against his grandmother, Maacah, who was the wife of Rehoboam, the mother of Abijah, and now the grandmother of Asa. And you can even see in the text, here's a woman who had some influence. She was a woman of prominence. She was a woman who was displaying this defiance of God, the idolatry. She made an obscene image. It doesn't say what it was, but she had, she had erected this thing and was encouraging people to worship this thing and the God that it represented. Asa took a stand against that. And this was a prominent woman. He banished her from her position and took a stand against all the evil that was associated with her. Friends, I'm telling you, that's faith. And what that shows me is it's possible. It doesn't matter if your family isn't godly. It doesn't matter if your friends are not godly or the people around you are not what they should be in God. You can be godly. You can have faith. You can trust God. And you can do this with confidence knowing God is by your side. That's what I love about Asa. It says he did what was right. And one of the things that prompted him to do what was right was God's sending a message through the prophets saying that if you turn to me and serve me, I will never leave you. If you stand with me, I'll stand with you. One good example of that is in 2 Chronicles chapter 15. Notice where it says in verses 1 and 2, the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Obed, he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. In verse 7, But you, be strong, and do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. Now notice this in verse 8. When Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Obed the prophet, he took courage and removed the abominable idols from all the land of Judah and Benjamin from the cities which he had taken in the mountains of Ephraim. And he restored the altar of the Lord that was before the vestibule of the Lord. What did that? What motivated him to be so radical in his response to society and the thing that prompted him was his faith in God God told him I will not abandon you you stand with me I'm gonna stand with you be strong and trust me and as a result he was able to do that which he was maybe intimidated to do before he, he, he was able to conquer fear he was able to conquer m mountains in society because of his faith in God you we can have this you can have that faith I can have that faith to do what I've never done before with confidence in God. But it all gets down to this, friends. It all gets down to trusting God. That's what this, he trusted. It's not like he just heard these words and said, okay, yeah, let's do that. No, he heard the words and he let them penetrate his heart, sink into his heart. And he trusts God. And as a result, he responded. But that's, really, well, that's what all this is about, is trusting God. You ever teach a child to swim? You ever go through that? I, I remember when we had a pool at home above ground, not real deep, trying to teach the kids to swim, you know, and the, the knees are shaking and all that, and they're trembling. Just jump. Just jump. Just trust me. 
I'm, I won't do any. I'm standing. I won't let anything happen to you. But just jump. And when they eventually jump, what happens? They're, they're thankful. They're relieved because they conquered a fear. They've learned a new skill or whatever. And they're able to enjoy it as a result. You know, and now my kids are in their mid-20s. You might think I was talking about something 20 years ago, but this was last week I was talking to them. Just trust your daddy. Come on, trust me. Wouldn't you love to have a father like me? But seriously, you can see the fear, and then you can see the difference when they actually, and that's what I'm trying to get them to see, or you, you can do that with your, you're trying to get them to trust you. Trust me and my love for you. I won't let anything happen to you. I will use everything in my power to protect you. Trust me. That's exactly what God did with Asa, and that's exactly what he wants from you. He wants you to believe him. Not only believe in him, and he is tremendous, our God and our maker. Tremendous world. And to think he spoke this into existence in six days, what kind of God made us? What kind of God do we serve? But it's not just he wants us to believe that he is. He wants us to believe that he will reward us who trust him, who believe in him. That we are able to do things we were not able to do before because of our confidence in him. And the thing that establishes that is his word. That's what changed Asa, the word of God and his belief in the author. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This is why it's so great that we assemble to study and worship because it builds our faith. But God wants us to hear his word and to believe him. And the point is that we can grow in that faith. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. We can overcome is the lesson. We can overcome, and our faith can be what it has never been. It can excel and develop. You can be a person of a stronger faith. That's possible is the first thing we need to see in adding to our faith. I believe another good point to consider is that our faith is going to be tested. And so we need to add to it. It's going to be tested. Now again, I can go back to Asa and see this. When you turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 14, what you see is a man who had some trouble during his reign. Now you would think a man who did all that renovating spiritually in his kingdom then he would just be sailing along no conflict things like that and there was peace certainly but there was also moments of opposition in second chronicles chapter 14 there was one of those moments where it talks about this threat from another nation now asa had an army of 300,000 men from judah who carried shields and spears and from benjamin 280,000 men who carried shields and drew bows. All these were mighty men of valor. So you have a fairly good-sized army here, almost 600,000. And they're all mighty men. That's a good number. That's a good military. But notice where it says in verse 9, Zerah the Ethiopian came out against them with an army of a million men and 300 chariots. So he was not only outnumbered, they were also outmatched with their weaponry. He had chariots, and that just raised it to a whole other level as far as the ability to overcome people. And so you had this major threat come upon this kingdom. They were about to be wiped out. They were outnumbered. They were outmatched by this enemy. What did Asa do? Asa turned to God, and he asked God for help with this matter. Notice this in 2 Chronicles chapter 14. In verse 11, it's a beautiful prayer. Notice this in verse 11. Asa cried out to the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing for you to help. Whether with many or with those who have no power, help us, O Lord our God. We rest on you, and in your name we go against this multitude. O Lord, you are our God. Do not let men prevail against you. Now, think about that. Next time you're in trouble or you have something threatening you, imagine responding this way. 
that God, you're God, and you, you're, th- this is nothing for you, for you to help me with this problem that's threatening me. Well, it says in verse 12 that the Lord struck the Ethiopians before Asa and Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. And Asa and the people who were with him pursued them to Gerar. So the Ethiopians were overthrown, and they could not recover. For they were broken before the Lord and his army, and they carried away very much spoil. Then they defeated all the cities around Gerar, for the fear of the Lord came upon them, and they plundered all the cities, for there was exceedingly much spoil in them. So, well done, Asa. He turned to God, he asked God for help, he trusted God, and it, and it worked out. He was able to defeat this great enemy. Now, I'm convinced the same thing's going to happen to you and to me. That there are going to be moments that are going to test our faith. It, it, it may be something that's political. It may be something in the workplace. It may be something in our family. It may be something in our health, finances. It could be something in our marriage or something with our children. It could be something that is a personal struggle for us. Something's going to come along and it's going to rub against that faith. It's going to test that faith whether or not we truly trust God to still jump, still give him our life. And Jesus says we've got to prepare for that now. He says in Matthew chapter 7 that you're either going to be a wise person or a foolish person in how you build your house. And it all gets back down to the soil. It gets back to the the foundation of your faith. And what he tells us is that we have to have the faith to prepare for the storms. Now, I've I've been amazed next door. You know, all these crews are here just about every day. And they've been here for months excavating the land next door to prepare for this subdivision that's coming in. And I've been blown away, because I've never seen this up close, but I've been blown away how they remove certain types of soil. I mean, Rodney was here for a while with the security system. He was showing me, explaining to me what they do, moving certain soil to different locations. And they had this machine that would vibrate the ground, shake the ground. I thought it was Eric. I thought something was going on in his office, but no, it's this machine over here that's just shaking the building. And it happens a lot, or it was especially around there. But they spent months preparing the foundation for this subdivision. And they're still working on it. They're they're still spending a lot of time developing the land. Why is that? The foundation's everything. You have to have a firm foundation in order to have progress. Jesus says that's exactly what we need to know about his word. In Matthew chapter 7, he says in verse 24 and 25, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them. Now back up. What's he saying here? Remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Well, listen, if you have that, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. You have to have a firm foundation because the storms do come. They do come. But if we listen to his word and trust him, we can endure. That's why you need to add to your faith. You and I need to add to our faith because it's going to be tested. One way or another, it's going to be tested at various times. I, th- this is beautiful language right here in Psalm 34 because this is what Peter goes back to in 1 Peter chapter 3. You know, who's going to love life and see good days? And talking about that and how the Lord, his ears are open to the prayers of the righteous. Well, Peter is quoting from Psalm 34. And it is so worth reading the entire psalm, but I'm not going to except for these few verses. In verse 4, Psalm 34. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. In verse 6, this poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. And the angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. That's our God. He knows we're going to be scared. He knows we're going to be tested. But he wants us to believe and to fear him. Those are the people who are protected. Those are the people whose house will stand. Let me say one last thing on this thought. 
this evening. Because you can learn this from Asa as well. And that is, faith can be lost. You know, what we've seen with Asa, that's a tremendous story. I hope it can be said of all of us. But it goes on to talk about in the story of Asa, especially in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, where it describes a period in his life when he was not the man of faith he used to be. In 2 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 1, notice through verse 3, in the 36th year of the reign of Asa. So this man's been king for a long time. Baasha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Ramah that he might let none go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. Then Asa brought silver and gold from the treasuries of the house of the Lord and of the king's house and sent to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, who dwelt in Damascus, saying, Let there be a treaty between you and me as there was between my father and your father. See, I have sent you silver and gold. Come, break your treaty with Baasha, the king of Israel, so that he will withdraw from me. And so what it's describing is this conflict. Asa's in Judah. He's going up against the king of Israel. But it says he petitions the king of Syria to come and deliver him from this threat. You might say, well, what's, what's the problem with that? Well, the problem, as God goes on to describe, is that he failed to do what he used to do. When he was threatened by the king of Ethiopia, what did he do? What was his first response? He turned to God for help, to ask God for help in conquering this enemy. Well, here you see he's bypassed all that. He's gotten rid of that formula and has reverted to the formula of trusting in his own wisdom. And it says in verse 7 that Hananiah the seer came to Asa the king of Judah and said to him, Because you have relied on the king of Syria and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. In other words... You are in a situation that if you would have handled it properly, you not only would have taken care of the king of Israel, then you would have been able to take care of your other enemy, the king of Syria. But because you didn't include God in this plan, now both of them are defeating you. In verse 8, God says to this prophet Hananiah, Were the Ethiopians and the Lubim not a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen, yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. In this you have done foolishly, therefore from now on you shall have wars. So God's saying, look, you messed up. You messed up because you didn't stay with what works. You didn't stay with the basics of turning to me and asking me for help and trusting me to provide. Now you would think a man who had reigned 36 years and has a history like Asa, after hearing this indictment from God through this prophet, that he would say, okay, you know what? You're right. I messed up. I failed. God is right that I should have done it the other way like I used to. And I'm totally sorry for that. Please forgive me. That You would think... That would be the good response for somebody who just heard this message from God. But instead, Asa doubled down. And his heart hardened. And he became more bitter toward God. And he took it out on this prophet. It says in verse 10 of 2 Chronicles chapter 16. Notice this. Asa was angry with the seer. And put him in prison, for he was enraged at him because of this. And Asa oppressed some of the people at that time. There's the danger of handling God's word, as this prophet found. Because Asa took it out. He, he literally threatened the messenger for that message. He didn't stop there. It says in verse 12, in the 39th year of his reign, Asa became diseased in his feet, and his malady was severe. Yet in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but the physicians. And that's how this man's story ends. He is, his story ends with defiance of God. It says in verse 13, Asa rested with his fathers. He died in the 41st year of his reign. Now look, it shows us right there. He was doing really well for 36 years as a king. 
Those last five years of his life were his worst. And the reason they were his worst is because that's the period when he lost his faith in God. The last five, if he had died in the 36th year, he would have been much better off. But he reigned 41 years, and the last five were not a beautiful story. It was not a very positive story in this man's history. Why do you have to add to your faith? Why, why, why should you and I diligently put forth an effort to make our faith grow? Why? Why is it so important? Because it can die if we don't. If it's not growing, it's dying. If we're not exerting it and, and, and working it and praying for it and asking God for help for our faith to get stronger, it will diminish. It will die. It will, it, will, it will fail the test. If you don't use it, you lose it. We know that message. I mean, like Stephanie, she's here, this knee surgery. We see the importance of therapy. We see the importance of continuing to move that leg, move those muscles. If you want that growth to occur, if you want to remain strong, become strong, you have to move, you have to stretch, you have to endure pain. You can't take it easy and not move it, you need therapy in order for it to recover and to grow. My faith needs therapy. I need for it to be exerted. I need for it to be tested. And I need to respond with trust in God. Here's what God wants us to know in Hebrews chapter 10. The just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. God tells us that because it's possible. It's possible for us to draw back. And if we're not careful, the last period of our life, things can fall apart if we're not consciously developing our faith. I remember this man from growing up, and we were very fortunate. I was fortunate my mom became a Christian when I was about four years old, somewhere in there. And so I was very fortunate to grow up attending church. And there was this man there, a widow, widower, who was such a friend to the children that he, he was the candy cane guy. You know, some of you are the candy people. I mean, there are some women here that you're known as the candy person. Well, this guy was the candy cane dude. Well, you know he had my attention. All right, so I was very good friends with this guy. But he was a man who really did encourage kids. I mean, he, he bought all of us notebooks and pens to encourage us to take notes in services. And that was a very good habit to get into. And it was all coming from this guy's influence. Very good man. Well... Life goes on, and I moved away, so on and so forth. And years later, I, I had the preacher who was there at that time, I had him come to a meeting for us when we were in Georgia. And I asked this brother, who's dead now, Brother Bobby Thompson. But I asked him, I said, hey, whatever happened to Brother so-and-so? I don't want to mention his name, but he goes, oh, uh, well, he ran into some trouble. And he mentioned how this brother had gotten in a marriage that Jesus said was adulterous, that he had a right to marry, but the woman he married did not have a right to marry. And he didn't want to get out of that, and so they had no choice but to mark, mark him for his sinful marriage. And it was just so sad to hear that about this brother. And as far as I know, he, he died in that condition. I understand companionship. I do. I understand the, the, the value of having somebody in your life, especially as you get older. I can see that. But is there any one person in this world that's worth giving up your relationship with God? Is there anything in this world that is worth abandoning the person who made you, who loves you, who sustains your life, who forgives you, and who wants nothing more than for you to be with him in eternity? Is there any person or thing in this world that's worth giving up God? Is it? And I think we all know the answer. 
But friends, the point is, you and I have got to protect our faith. This thing's not over. It's not over. And so we have to be people who guard our faith, guard our devotion to the Lord, and plead with Him daily to help, his, help us love Him with all of our heart. In 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter says, here's the end of your faith. The end of your faith is heaven. In 1 Peter chapter 1, talking about Jesus Christ in verse 7, verse 8, whom having not seen you love. Well, that's faith. You love somebody you don't see. Though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith. What's that? The salvation of your souls. And until that happens, keep believing. And until that happens, keep adding to your faith. Until that happens, until you see God and he says, welcome home, that's when you give up the battle for faith. That's what he's saying. And so I share these thoughts with myself and with you. I need to add to my faith. Because faith is real. I can have faith. It's possible. Faith's going to be tested, but faith can be lost if I don't work it. Therefore, add to your faith. Thank you, friends, for listening patiently to what I had to share. I heard something recently I thought was really good. I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. I love that. I love that because that's so true. I'm a nobody. I'm a sinner, a filthy sinner who needs mercy. And by the mercy of God, he extends forgiveness to us through the blood of Jesus Christ. That somebody who will save anybody. And I don't care what sins you've committed. I don't care what you've done. God will forgive you. And here's the comforting thought. There's no sin you can commit. He hasn't seen before. And he hasn't forgiven before. He loves you. But you have to believe. You have to have faith. That if you come to him through his son. He will save you. If you're willing to acknowledge that faith in Jesus. Turn it away from every sin you know of. Be buried with him in baptism. Enter that body and raise to walk in newness of life. Or if you need to respond in any other way, come to a God who loves you as we stand and sing.